this picture. Welcome, everyone. Good to see everybody. Nice turnout tonight. And welcome to the April meeting of Mecklenburg Audubon. I'm Steve Coggin. I'm the president. And tonight we have Justin Orders of Queen's Orders Honey. And he'll be talking about the buzz about not David Watson, but bees, sustainable check. beekeeping. <laughs> We've had a lot going on in the last couple months. Uh, in March and April, we had the winning photographs from the Audubon photo contest. And we had a lot of people volunteer to come out and make that happen. The photos were shown at Wing Haven. They were shown here at last month's meeting and they were shown at the Eastway Regional Recreation Center. And we had over 300 people view the pictures before we sent them on to their next destination. So a lot of people we're out and helping with that. And want to thank everyone, particularly Judy Walker. And another thing we had was Advocacy Day. And that was about a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, where we had about 15 of our members go to Raleigh and we spent the whole day lobbying the legislature for bills that Audubon supports. And so thanks for everyone who made the trip to walk Raleigh and did that. We're recruiting new members for the board of Mecklenburg Audubon. So if you have an interest in taking on a role on the board, please talk with Chris Bowling in the back. He's the chair of the nominating committee and he'll take down your particulars and see if you qualify. <laughs> Are you breathing? <laughs> no, we don't even care about that. <laughs> On Earth Day, April 22nd, we have the spring bird count. And this is set up just like the Christmas bird count and with the same area and the same locations. So if you would like to be involved with that, we always need people to work on that. And the contact for that is Jeff Lemons. His email address is up there and he would be glad to hear from you. We have a whole lot of bird walks coming up in April. Mm -hmm. Richard, would you care to say anything? There it is. <laughs> we have a bunch. Except that the uh, Saturday trip is washed out. Yeah. <laughs> Not going to go. This coming Saturday. Yeah, next Saturday, Latin, Latin Preserve. I think one thing to say, you know, I don't know if you all uh, thought Google group, Sean Brenner sent out a note wondering why we're still going under COVID protocols. And we decided to kind of back away from the language uh, protocol. But uh, the explanations we got from the leaders. Okay. That's right. I'm on Zoom. You're on Zoom. Yeah. So the, the explanation we got from the leaders is that they really like the size. You know, 12 is a really good number, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less, depending on the venue. And so, you know, the only thing that we've done is just kind of taken out the, the protocols about COVID because we're no longer under the county or the you know, the various governmental restrictions. So, um, so I think that's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, but in doing that, he mentioned Blue Ridge Audubon and Blue Ridge has um, three walks every month, which I think is great. They do them on Saturday mornings, same three locations on the first, second and third Saturday and Ventures Birding does, you know, leads the walks. And as I looked around at the different chapters and I think Ron's exactly right. I mean, we do about as many walks as pretty much all the other chapters combined. combined and, and with volunteers. 
So, you know, I think we have to just continue to thank our volunteers. To touch the base Right, or as the challenger has asked. If Blue Ridge Audubon ran three walks in March and we ran third. A continuous order. Yeah, the ten walks in there. Of personal liberty. <laughs> right. It would be one every, day. every three days. That's correct. Right. Uh, speech is 800. It'll be this or it'll be yeah. the liberty of the yeah. yeah. Malcolm X in a 1964 right. speech. What is the ballot? The ballot of, All, right. Right. All right. State of the Art Museum, 1600. DePaul Art Museum. Yeah. It was. What is Minnesota? Yeah. Uh, I'd like to. That's correct. Uh, 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 2000. Give our presentation. The Parthenon Frist Art Museum. Brian, what is Tennessee? Your native Tennessee is correct. Uh, Very good. Uh, right. uh, Golden yeah. Girls, 1200, please. You have found. Closer. Uh, Golden Girls, 2400. Here's your clue in Golden Girls. At the Winter Olympics in 2018, Anna Gosser of Hello, Austria please. became the first woman to do the big That's air good, good, in this good, good. Sport. I may move around a bit too. I'll try to refrain from doing that. Oh, the mic. 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 I'm a beekeeper. Right. Um, yes. First and foremost, Mod thanks to Steve Mod for uh, inviting and me you to do this. Delete for having the me competition. Do this. Me on a dinner too, just a minute ago. So it's a really good gig so far. Also, thank <laughs> you to whoever brought banana pudding. Uh, who's that? Are you? Thank you. It's actually, I'm almost like, this is strange. It's my birthday tomorrow. And that's my favorite. Like I always have banana pudding on my birthday. I probably won't have it this year because it just got so much going on. So thank you for that. If I all of a sudden like fall to the ground, that's because of the sugar rush and I'm crashing. Um, so I ate a lot of that because uh, I just can't not eat that. So I stalked you online and that family. Ah, I know. I talk about it a lot. I got a whole blog devoted to ban banana pudding. Um, that's definitely going to be like my top ten ever banana pudding. All that aside, uh, so yeah, bees. Why am I here? Um, <laughs> so, uh, Sharon, one of your members, I just learned. Well, I, I knew of her before, um, but she runs the bee school for Mecklenburg County uh, Beekeeping Association, which I'm a part of. Mecklenburg County Beekeeping Association. I, as you assume, will learn, win through uh, the bee school that they present. Um, what I'm going to teach you a lot is along along the same lines as what they teach. So she's probably going to like uh, correct pretty much everything I say and say like this. Don't do that. Don't do that. It's, it's going to be very uh, informative, um, but I, I want to bring this to your attention, not so that you become a beekeeper tomorrow. Um, that'd be great if you did, but I know this is a, a, a club about birds. Um, I think that they have some similarities, especially just being able to observe the bees has been the most, the, the hands down one of the, like the best experiences I've ever had in my life. And I want to be able to share that with you in whatever way I can, if that's educating you about well, how I take care of my bees and the things that they do that uh, make me so fascinated with them, that's great. Um, but if you say, yeah, I'm just going to stick with birds after this, that's perfectly fine too. Um, but still, I'm going to share with you what I know. Uh, next slide. So introduction, a little bit about me. Um, I started beekeeping in 2018, uh, bought a hive from now the, uh, is he, is Tommy Helms the president of Beekeeping Association or is he was last year he was the president, former president, uh, of Beekeeping Association, he just ran out of his term, nothing bad, bad happened, um, but, uh, and <laughs> I know, <laughs> must have been whoever went out to dinner with us, we had yeah. Mexican food. <laughs> Uh, we started giving the slides uh, with one hive, barely made it through that year. Uh, with that one hive, basically just through help of other beekeepers in the area. The following year, I did go through bee school, as I said. I'm now a certified beekeeper in the state of North Carolina. Yay! Uh, that gave me a lot of information that I just had no idea about, which I will be sharing with you tonight. Um, 
My apiary is currently located in Huntersville, uh, just outside of 45, uh, really like right on the border of Huntersville and Charlotte. Uh, I have about 40 to 50 hives there currently. I'm actually in the process of selling some of them because that's what I do this time of year. Um, but yeah, I love it. I love beekeeping. I love insects. Even more about me, I really wanted to go to school for entomology when I was in my undergraduate at UNCC. I wanted to go to NC State. That didn't really pan out, but I just love bugs. I Ever since I was a kid, I was the weird guy in the backyard picking up rolling polies and stuff and just like figuring out what it was, uh, much to the chagrin of my friends that wanted to do other things and play basketball. I was like, no, let's play with bugs. And so not, you know, at least this is this is what you can do if you are that, you know, person in, in your life, whatever, you can become a beekeeper. There's hope for us. Uh, next slide. So this is a quote that I've heard a lot. Um, not sure how accurate it is. If he's a smart guy, but like it may be sooner, it may take longer, but essentially Albert Einstein, when he was alive, said that, uh, the bee population is so important to our agricultural system, our food system, that if they were to die for some reason, we would all die pretty soon after. And he means bees as in all pollinators. I really want to get that across because I'm not just talking, talking about, about honeybees, even though I am advocating for honeybees. Is that's what's got me into this whole thing. Um, it's not. It's all pollinators. It's 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 the native bees. It's honeybees, it's butterflies, it's wasps, it's flies, it's bats, it's all these things that are so important to our not only agriculture system, but our flowers, our gardens, whatever you want to call it, they are very necessary for us to live and live happy, good lives. When I start keeping bees in an area, people are just amazed. They're like, honeybees exist? What? We haven't seen bees around here in forever. All of a sudden, they see bees in their flowers, their gardens, their whatever, their trees. And it's really like we're sort of learning is there's a problem going on um, with pollinators um, that needs to be addressed. And that's really what I choke, um, drove me to become a beekeeper was that whole the bees are dying along the way, saving the bees agenda, which... Honeybees, yes, are part of that, but I'm also going to touch on other, some other bees here too. But more importantly, honeybees, you know, for this presentation, are at risk of some pretty nasty things, and we need to be aware of what those things are and how to fix them. Can we wait a second? Stop Take your time. Yep. Uh, we have lost your uh, slides. Okay, um, yep, not so yet. Not yeah. yet. Not yet. <laughs> you want to do a TikTok video? Yeah, <laughs> I, I I don't get on my TikTok. Dance. Yeah, <laughs> well, I dance. Not as good as they can. <laughs> but the D suit, yeah, I should have done that. Okay, go that's for my children presentations. <laughs> You're on. Uh so how many bees specifically are responsible for population of eighty percent of U.S. crops? I think they said that. About a third to a fourth of the food on your dinner plate is produced through the pollination that specifically honeybees do. All these uh, wonderful fruits and vegetables at the bottom of the screen, kiwi fruit, passion fruit, uh, watermelon, squash, uh, macadamia nuts, Brazil nuts. There's plenty of effect about Brazil nuts too. That's really interesting. I'll talk about it later. Uh, but all those things are produced by the pollination specifically of honeybees. So again, very, very important that they are around and they are not uh, suffering or they are in decline. I'll just keep oh, going. I, I think I got it from you. Yeah, stuff to do. Also, I, 
I actually work for some of you guys may know. Um, his name is uh, David Jacobo with Eco Backyards. Great guy. He has a great service, and he has informed me a lot of great things, which um, not this specifically, but just the information about native species, what belongs in this climate, what belongs in this area. And honeybees, unfortunately, are not one of those species for insects. They came from Europe. Their actual epis mellifera is Western, Western honeybee or European honeybee. There is no really native honeybee to this area. In fact, the uh, native Native Americans called it white man's fly when we first brought it over. So they weren't a big fan of it. Uh, we were because, of course, they produce honey. And I don't know if we were really yeah. using it for our cultural purposes at that point, but we still wanted it. We still wanted it here. So we did that. And now there's different breeds. There's Russian, there's German, there's uh, Carniolan, which is kind of Russian and Italian. Uh, all these that we brought over and they've really done very well here. That doesn't necessarily mean that they are invasive to, to the, the extent that we have like spotted lantern fly, like emerald ash lantern, fly, lantern not fly, causing or wreaking or havoc ash on lantern. our uh, climate and our system like some of these insects. Um, they do habitate with other insects as well. They're not in constant competition with them. Um, maybe they do belong in, they've kind of made a place in our ecosystems and then they've done pretty well. Um, now, mind you, if you had 800 hives in your backyard, yeah, they'd probably be competing for some other insects for resources, but if you keep it sustainable to a level, to a degree that it's not causing problems, then we're gonna be okay. Just want to cover that because we this is the Audubon Society too, and I know we're all about ecosystem and conservation and, and preserving, and I am too. I just want to get that across too. So brief, this is just the brief biology of bees for honeybees. Um, there's only one queen per hive. Every single hive has maybe it can have maybe 20, 30,000 bees. But there's one queen, and that's very important because if that queen dies they're gonna have some problems or they're gonna to have to replace it. Uh, the male bees are known as drones. They're a little bit bigger than the worker bees and their main purpose in life is to make and die. That is pretty much it. So much so that if they live past their, essentially the time that they would do their job, they are taken out of the hive by the worker bees, the female bees, because they're saying, Look, you're going to be freeloading during the winter. You haven't done your job. All you're going to do is eat. They can't sting. They don't guard the bees. They don't take care of the nurse or the, they don't nurse the baby bees. They are essentially useless. So they are dragged out. There are videos of them dra being dragged out of the hive because the workers say, you're not essential. Get out of here. And then they reproduce and make them more in the spring when it's time to start mating again, do the mating flights. We just want to get that across. I, I think... There's uh, a certain, in our society, what do you want me to call a patriarchy? <laughs> and I just kind of want to, it's not always like that in nature, as it's probably the same with birds as well. Yeah. Um, you know, this one is, honeybees is most definitely a matriarchy being that not even the queen is really in charge, though it has that title of queen, she's the one laying the eggs. It's really the worker bees that boss her around. When it's time for her to swarm and thus make another hive or go fly somewhere else, they actually chase her around the hive so that she loses weight so that she can fly better when they need to swarm. So really, they're in charge. They're just forcing her to do everything. When sometimes when sometimes I'll find a queen and she like tries to fly away, the bees will actually like go fly, grab her and bring her back in the hive. Not that she's like trying to escape or maybe she is, but still they're like, you got to stay here. Where are you going? Uh, not time for that yet. Uh, in the female workers, they are in charge of all these things here. We're talking nursing larva, wax production, building essentially the building blocks of the hive, attending to the queen. That's, you know, making sure she has everything she needs, guarding the hive, aka stinging, and forging food. And that's basically their life cycle in order. They start as a nurse bee, they start making wax. Once they're done attending to the queen, they kind of get their wings and or just flying around the hive, making sure everything's okay. And then eventually they forage for food, which is what they do until they die, which is all about six to seven weeks. They last six to seven weeks. Um, same about the male bees, they're about the same time period. The queen, however, can live up to 
they say five years, but I've never seen a queen live up to five. It's usually around this, at this day and age and, and this culture, bee culture, whatever, it's about one to three years, but still it's a really long time for an insect. Um, and in that time they have, they're laying constantly. That's basically all they're doing, laying eggs, laying eggs, laying legs until they die. So busy as a bee is a very accurate analogy. Uh, next slide. Just for some visuals here, not real life size, thank God. <laughs> um, male, that's the drone bee. You can see he's a little bit bigger than what we're talking the worker bee and the queen. Very, very distinguishable. Well, not really, but the biggest distinguishable characteristic is her larger abdomen. That's where she has all her eggs. And yeah, other than that, it's pretty hard to distinguish the worker and the queen bee. Next slide. So are all the worker bees females then? Yes. All the workers, if she can sting or lay eggs, she's a female. So we're going to talk a lot of things today. Uh, not that, that is, um, I've actually never done that. That's not me, um, but just a little picture driver. Uh, swarms, varroa mites, which is what were basically uh, honeybees enemy number one. Uh, queen health, requeening, uh, viruses that the, the, the bees have to deal with. And really, just what they have to do in the fall and winter. Yes. Is, is the queen the queen from birth, or does another female turn into the queen? Great question. So we repeat it. it. Repeat. It. He asked, uh, uh, "Is a queen a queen from birth?" And the answer is yes. Uh, so what happens is when, say, right now this time of year. The bees are wanting to do exactly that. No, that no, that's great. They want a swarm. A swarm is essentially just like in flowers, their way of reproducing, saying, this is a really successful hive. We need to go repopulate somewhere else, spread our genetics somewhere else because we've done so well. This queen from this hive is going to go fly to a new location. That was beautiful. That swarm right there was hanging from a three foot branch right off the ground huge swarm put it right in the box and in that swarm there's about a couple thousand bees and one queen now what happened to that old hive that they swarmed from that queen before she left laid a bunch of different eggs in that hive that the the worker bees are feeding what is known as royal jelly it's this white milky substance that as the name applies kind of gives you the royal uh or name uh, they once they're fed that royal jelly from birth, they de develop into a queen. So, yeah, not from birth. They're basically a daughter of that queen until they're fed the royal jelly, and then they become the queen. And like I was saying with the swarm, um, it's their way of reproducing. Basically, this is their swarm season uh, from now until really about uh, this year is probably going to be a little bit earlier, but uh, mid June. Um, and I get a lot of calls on this. I'm actually on the Mecklenburg County swarm list, which means that I get called if there's a swarm and someone doesn't know what to do with it. I, one, call them if you have a swarm or call me, call Sharon, call any beekeeper, do not spray. I think we all probably know that. But more importantly, they are not aggressive. They're not trying to sting you. They're not trying to hurt you. They may eventually try to call, go into your house, which ideal, ideally is not great. But not to be feared. Uh, they're really actually drunk on the pheromone of the queen because she's the one telling them where to go and they get really loopy when they're on this. You can see there's a, a huge cloud of bees just going every which way and just kind of like figuring out where's the next location. It's really cool. Honestly, if you ever get a chance to see a swarm, it's one of the most fascinating things you'll ever be able to witness as far as bees go. Um, yeah, uh, we can go next slide. Come on. <laughs> and so this is something that as a beekeeper you're going to need to be on top of um because you do not want to go chasing swarms up in trees this is not only difficult but it's also potentially dangerous you could fall out of the tree the bees could fall on you and that not be great either um what i do is essentially these are what you asked before, those cells are, or those little long peanut shaped things, those are called queen cells. And each in each one of those is a unborn queen. She's ready to hatch out, or once she hatches out, there's gonna be that many queens in the hive to replace 
the queen that is left. So what I do, I go around every single hive that I have, make sure that they do not have one of those about to hatch out. Um, it takes a little while, takes some work, takes a lot of looking around, but if I can prevent that, I am in a much better shape than if I let my hive swarm and go somewhere and then lose that queen, lose the bees. Uh, it sets me back as far as honey production and all that, and I really, really don't want to do that. Go to the next slide. So we talked about this Varroa mite, and this is what we're talking about when we're saying essentially the whole Save the Bees movement started because of this tiny little red insect, uh, which migrated from, I guess it doesn't migrate, but it came from Southeast Asia. Um, and it's, it's given to this, what we now know as colony collapse disorder, where the bees, when dealing with this mite, it does not know how to deal with it. And thus, especially in the winter, they die. The, the biggest theory is that the mite feeds on the food stores of the bee, depleting it of the things that it needs to stay warm during the winter. And when it doesn't have that, it's not able to regulate temperature. It's not able to, it, it, will, it will starve much quicker. Um, it can spread diseases and viruses and just really wreaks havoc if you have a high mite load or what we call mite load or mite population in the hive. Uh, you want to think of it as mosquitoes in our population. There's always going to be mosquitoes, just like there's always going to be mites in a hive. It's just about keeping it at a threshold that's comfortable. If you have too many mites in the hive, it's going to be a problem. Um, but this is something that you really, if you want to be beekeeping, this is something you have to pay a lot of attention to constantly because um, they're everywhere. Every continent where bees exist, you're going to find these mites. Some bees, some breeds of bees are better at uh, dealing with them than others. But in general, they've all got them and they're all a problem for all bees. Yeah, I love that analogy. It's equivalent of having a mite or a, a mite the size of a dinner plate on your body. That's how big they are yeah. to the bees. Yeah. So then you can see it on that. And that's not usually how it is. Really, they feed them the larvae. I'm actually going to show a video here in a moment um, that'll demonstrate the life cycle. But yeah, that's really rare. That's how they, they basically ride the bee from flower to flower, flower or hive to hive using that. But they don't, they're not feeding on the bee in that scenario, in that picture. Next slide. Actually, can, can you click that blue link? I hope so. <laughs> if not, I'll do my best job for you now. Yeah. I have no idea why this is working. <laughs> hey, we got it. I'm assuming it's showing to the folks on the Zoom. Why <laughs> now? We don't. Oh, come on, you do this guy. Yeah. <laughs> Not the last. What? There we go. We get to see the simple bedtime hack. You can see it. Does this have sound? It does. Uh oh. <laughs> oh no. Uh, Why so many? Well, when it comes to the Barolo mite, there's no such thing as just one. And if you'd like to see how an infestation starts, you need to look no further than your own bees, especially drones, as they're pretty social and like to travel between hives. Since Barua mites don't have any wings of their own, they slip into hives by hitching a ride on the backs of adult bees. And for the lucky mite, the trip includes an in-flight meal, as Barua mites will begin feeding on honeybees' fat body tissue within a few minutes of clinging to the bees. Once they've entered the hive, Barua mites slip undetected into the vulnerable, uncapped brood cells. This is where the mites lay in wait until the bees cap the brood. Once a cell is capped, the mother mite, like a tiny spider, climbs atop the cocoon of the developing bee, tears open a hole, and begins to feed on its fat body tissue. Within three days, the mother mite lays her first egg, which always develops into the male. Then, she lays one female egg every 30 hours over the next week or so, in a newly acquired hole under the brood cap. As each of these female mites mature, they mate with their brother. By the time the baby bee develops and leaves its infested cell, 
as many as three fertilized mites will emerge with it, and the cycle continues. Using this strategy, the varroa mite population can grow as fast as the bee population it feeds on. But when summer ends and the bee population declines, the hive is left with a huge mite population, and that's dangerous. Too many mites in a hive will overwhelm and kill entire bee colonies. So what does that mean for everyone's favorite insect, the honeybee? Well, honeybee colonies with heavy mite infestations can't effectively pollinate or produce honey because they suffer from diseases and viruses transmitted by the mites. In fact, honeybees suffer from as many as 20 different mite-induced viruses, including a devastating deformed wing virus, which prevents them from flying. If you want to give your honeybees a fighting chance against varroa mites, it's time to introduce your bees to Don's organic layers to learn more about Don. So yeah, pretty scary stuff. Uh, I've, I've experienced firsthand that deformed wing virus. It is nasty. Their wings, the whole body of the bee is just depressing. It's just like they don't want to live. They don't live for very long. Uh, because they're not, they're one, malnourished, and two, they will be able to fly, they will be able to I'm trying to get out of this. <laughs> Let's see, you may be able to, there we go, perfect, all right, you can go to the next slide, and yeah, that's a demonstration, of like, what they're doing with larvae. Why did this happen? Why do we have these bees that have these mites? Uh, essentially, we did this to ourselves, just like all agricultural uh, things in the United States. We like bigger is better. So we made these bees that have really, really big fat bodies. And guess what? That's like a picnic for these mites. We scientifically selected for bees that didn't evolve with these mites. So this came from Southeast Asia. Guess what? The bees in Southeast Asia, Asia in general, even Russia, they have developed with these mites for thousands of years. So they know how to deal with them. They are more hygienic and they clean themselves from these mites. Uh, these bees that are maybe Italian or, or uh, German or whatever, they have no idea what these mites are and they don't have any idea how to deal with them. Uh, we do practices such as not treating or really in any sort of agriculture system. And we all know about livestock places not being the cleanliness, cleanliest and so what we do with bees, the same thing. We don't treat, we don't keep them clean. And eventually when these mites come in, they just wreak havoc. Um, and there's really nothing that we can do at that point. Um, and you can go on to the next slide. So how do we control this? You're gonna need to control it somehow. Not only is this dangerous for bee populations, but bring it full circle, these bees can transfer these mites to native bees by just going to a flower, all of a sudden that mite that's on the flower, it's gonna transfer over to something else. Now they're not going to be able to have as much of an effect on that bee because they really thrive in a setting like the hive where there's thousands and thousands and thousands of larvae in that hive that the mites can feed on. However, it's still not great, especially since they can uh, transmit diseases and viruses. And also no one's taking care of that native bee. We have beekeepers to help with whatever we've got in our backyards with these honeybees. There's no lobbyist. Well, there is a lobbyist for native <laughs> bees, but it's not as good as what we call big honey, which is what we have here, which wants people to have bees, wants the honey industry to do well. And it's benefiting me. I'm not going to crit criticism. However, we need to, oh, as always, I'm going to say this a thousand times, need to be thinking not just of honeybees, but of all pollinators. Honeybees just happen to be very, 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 very good pollinators and ones that are really fun to observe as well. But here are all the different ways you can treat for varroa. Uh, my favorite is the first one listed is oxal acid. It's actually an organic compound that you can spray into the hive, kills the mites uh, within a couple of days, but does not harm the bees. Some of these other things, the uh, formic pro, I believe that's what that, uh, that video is advertising, can potentially hurt the bees. Um, so you're, you're dealing with some things that may not want to introduce into the hive. However, it's a necessary evil for how evil these mites are. In fact, their genus name, species name is Varroa Destructor. Huh. That's how bad they are. Yeah, someone had was like, I hate these things so much, I'm going to put that in their name. Um, mm -hmm. There's a natural way of dealing with this. Essentially, you deprive the hive of their queen, essentially the larva of the hive, so that the mites have nothing to feed on. 
once she's gone, once she's not laying eggs, unless you control the mite population uh, naturally. And that's, uh, some people do that entirely. They don't have to do any of these chemicals. And you can do that too. If that's your way, of, uh, if you want to be a chemical-free beekeeper, it takes a little more time and work. However, it can be done. Sorry, next slide. Yeah. Wait on. I saw you. Were I was just like I pausing for a bit. Uh, so maybe you have a queen. So that's a queen bee right there. With one with the, they're all kind of surrounding with a big red dot on it. That's not my bee, though. That's kind of what my bees do look like. Um, I do mark them, especially this year, it was uh, the color of red. Uh, we want to requeen because that queen can only last maybe tops three years. She might decline in health, and we want to preserve her or preserve the health of that hive or as long as we can. Sometimes these queens just come right out the gate and they're doing great, they're laying well. Some other times they they don't lay as well as uh, other queens. There's like shotgun pattern where they lay one, one cell, they lay an egg, then the next one they do, the next one they do, the next three they don't, and then it's just this really weird pattern. And it's not great, it's not great for the bees. Eventually, if that persists, they may die just because they're lacking the numbers that they really want to hide. Um, and, and you don't always have to do this. You can allow nature to take effect here. And if that queen dies, they replace her. If they find her inadequate, again, they're in charge of that being the workers, they will replace her. But as a beekeeper that is, I mean, I'm very reliant on this as my income and my livelihood. I need to make sure my uh, hive is doing as best as it can. So I need to requeen. I need to find ways to replace queens if she's not doing very well. And that means what I'm about to show on the next slide. Queen rear, and this is the most fun thing I found to do in beekeeping. Those little cells right there, or may not, you may not refer to them themselves, but I do, those are queen cells. They are from that, like you asked, that egg that is then fed royal jelly on top of royal jelly, on top of royal jelly, and then when those develop long enough, they mature into a queen. Now, I can then take that cell, that's what I call a queen cell, put it into a hive that doesn't have a queen, that queen, when she emerges, will then be the queen of that hive. And that means that I can have as many queens as I want. That means I can have as many hives as I want. That means I can sell these hives, which is what I do. I can sell these queens if I want. And more importantly, I get to develop this tiny little insect into being like the biggest part of this, this, this system, this hive, this colony. I get to see her develop all the way. And it's just, when you see this happen, I just, I can't put it into words. It's my <laughs> most amazing thing to see them and then they 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 start to react with her and sometimes they don't like her sometimes they want to kill her sometimes they're like this isn't another queen we want she doesn't smell right i don't know why she doesn't smell right but they just doesn't smell right and they kill her but sometimes when they do re react with her strongly it's a beautiful beautiful thing to witness um and i like to do this too because you can buy queens you can get queens from i guess like out west or to the Midwest or whatever, but I like to keep it local. Like everything I do in my life, I like to keep things sustainable. And in this process, I'm keeping the genetics here. The bees, the queens that develop from these cells, which are raised from my hives, are most adapted to develop and deal with the climate here in Charlotte, North Carolina, rather than Michigan or wherever else people get their queens from. So at the very least, you're keeping it local, and that's always a good thing. I have a question. Go ahead. Are these outside of the the hives? Where where are you keeping these queens? And do they all hatch at one time? Or Ooh, how, do you know when, how do you know when there's going to be a queen hatching? Or great question. It's a it's a timing thing. It's so there's a calendar that says. A question for him. She asked, where are these queens? These queen cells. Are they outside the hives? How do I know when the queen emerges? Is that a good thing? Yeah, when, it, when they're going to hatch or whatever. Yeah. So there essentially is a timetable that says, and I know it pretty well by now, but you can find this stuff online. Um, the second I take that egg and put her in one of those, it's a little tiny plastic cup. 
that I then put a little bit of royal jelly in it. That stuff that we feed the queens that makes her into a queen. I put it at the bottom of the cell with the egg. From that point forward, it takes about two weeks, roughly, for her to develop into a full queen and emerge. So I know, using that timetable, I need to drop that cell into a hive with bees for her to survive and do what she needs to do. If she's, if I, if all those cells come out at once, all those queens, the first one that emerges, will try to kill as many of those queens as she can. And the ones that emerge together will fight to the death. It's brutal. Um, sometimes they even have it where if that, if the hive is really, really large, they will all swarm together. I've caught a swarm last year with, I think, five or six queens in it, which is super rare. Usually, usually it's only one. I don't know how they got along long enough to do that. I just kept pulling queen after queen after queen after queen after the, at the swarm. Uh, but normally, yes, they kill themselves, they fight to the death. And this is preserving the uh, survival of the fittest. So the strongest will win. Um, that's, just, that's just nature. And, and it usually works out that way. Um, sometimes, though, it's just the first one that gets out, which I guess isn't as fair, but you can't make these rules up. Um, what do you do? Do you sell these? Yes. Yes. I sell, well, I don't sell those specifically, the cells. What I do is I put them into a hive, and once that queen emerges and then becomes the queen of the hive, then it's a perfectly good hive, and I will sell that. It's like a, what we call a nuke or a nucleus colony. It's a very small hive, it's a starter hive that will then develop into a larger hive once time passes. But for the time being, it's, you know, just like a smaller package. How big do you make it? Uh, this is, so we're talking frames now. And we're, and this is a Langstroth hive, uh, which is what we normally see. We've seen the boxes. That's what that is. It's uh, normally eight to five, or sorry, eight to 10 frames of bees, of food, of all sorts of stuff. That nucleus colony is five frames as opposed to eight or 10. So it's like half the size roughly, uh, but it's still everything you need. It's got bees, it's got queen, it's got food, it's got pollen, all the good stuff. Just give them a home and they'll thrive. So you've got 45 queens, right? 45. Is that a magic number? Did you do fewer or more? I, I, it's, it's, it's constantly changing. Because I'll go out tomorrow after someone calls me and says, hey, I've got a swarm on my tree, can you come grab it? There's another hive, um, or one of my hive swarms. There, I lost a hive. So it's especially this time of year, it's constantly fluctuating. I just say roughly 40 to 40, maybe 40 to 50 hives. And also, I keep bees for the people. So if people want to have bees, they don't want to lift a finger. Uh, maybe they want honey. Maybe they want it for pollination. Maybe they just like the aesthetic of having bees, and they get to witness the bees doing all the crazy things that I'm describing in their yard. Well, guess what? You can buy a hive from me. I service it like you would a gardener. Uh, I service it like you would a gardener. And there I have even more hives. So even people, I have hives outside of my yard and in my yard, um, constantly numbers changing. So it's a long answer. I probably should have repeated that as well. <laughs> Next slide. All right. Coming back to the viruses. So this is the deformed wing virus. Really, really gross. You obviously know something's wrong with the bee when you see this stuff. Um, they, if this persists, uh, the hive will like, do something about it. And it's pretty simple to fix. All you have to do is neutralize the hive and it should rebalance so long as the queen does not die. Uh, but we've got all sorts of stuff. Sac root, chalk root. I haven't really seen that one. Uh, and we don't have to worry about it as much here. It's, it usually stays, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a thing that has to do a lot with the uh, moisture uh, in the hive. Um, now this European and American foul root, interestingly enough, the American foul root is really, 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 really bad. Uh, when it exists in a hive, it, it used to be the only way up until really this year, the, the best way to treat it was essentially incinerate everything because it's a fungus that will, even when you kill all the bees or they die by their own accord, they will still persist in the hive for years. So beekeepers will just incinerate. They, there's like the only thing, but we've actually come up with the first known vaccine for insects, which is for American frowbert. 
It's crazy. You feed the queen a substance, and then from that point forward, she will lay eggs that will not get infected from this American power. Hmm. Pretty cool. Need to do that with people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're getting there. Uh, so honey essentially is their food stores for the winter. They don't eat all of it. There is some left over, but when you're taking the honey from the hive, as I do, um, again, not all of it, but some, um, I need to then replace the food that I've taken from the hive with what is basically a sugar syrup. And that's what I have right here, that bucket on top of the hive. I am feeding the bees sugar syrup so that when they go into winter, they have all the food they need to survive. Um, but that is a lot of sugar syrup. If I take 20 pounds of honey from the hive, that means I got to give them 20 pounds of sugar syrup. Um, it, and, and, and it takes a while for them to, to start to, to get it and put it in the hive. But once you do, uh, they're pretty much good through the winter. You got to keep up to uh, make sure they don't have too bad of a mite population. Maybe feed them a little bit of pollen. Pollen is essentially their protein source, uh, whereas Sugar is carbohydrates. That's the only things they really need. Uh, um, but once you go get that covered, they're pretty much set for the winter. Around here in North Carolina, unlike up north, you don't have to put any insulation on the hive, um, especially with as mild as a winter we had this year. It's It was pretty smooth sailing. Um, we had a couple weekends that were pretty cold, but other than that, um, honestly, we've got a really nice year uh, for the winters. So not too bad. Next slide. This is actually a hive that I had a couple of years ago. They are, those are all dead, essentially frozen bees. Um, you can even see a couple of them are inside the comb with their butts hanging out. That's because they were going into the cell of the hive or the cell of the comb looking for food and they just didn't have any because they just didn't have enough food. And they're actually clustered around, that's what we know as brood. That's the baby bees that have been hatched up. So they're trying to keep that warm as best they can. But when they run out of food, if they can't eat, they can't eat, and then they die. And that's what we got there. That's a, a starvation dead out. Um, pretty simple, pretty sad, but it was very easy to identify that was the cause of their death, their demise. Next slide. All right, so you may be saying, that was really cool, Justin. Uh, how do I get started? Well, there's a lot of resources for here in the state of North Carolina. I may be wrong about this, but I believe there was at one point six different state inspectors in the state of North Carolina. I'm not really sure it's accurate. Normally in a state, they about two or three. So just to say, there's a really strong beekeeping community, not just in uh, North Carolina, but Charlotte. Um, did I say Charlotte is the beekeeper? Bee they're right. Um, they're not. They're not. Uh, six inspectors in Charlotte. That would be wild. Uh, but it really is a great community here, not only um, in North Carolina, but we have the Mecklenburg Beekeeping Association, which I've been a part of, as I said before. A uh, lot of really uh, respected and seasoned beekeepers that are willing to help you. Uh, and you can do a lot with just that. If you're really interested in this, just reach out to them, reach out to me, finding a mentor, finding someone to sell you bees. Uh, and please, 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 please get some hands-on experience. I heard this the other day that is so perfect. There is not a hundred percent answer to anything in beekeeping. Nothing. It all depends on everything, on the weather, on the situation, on the health of your bees. Uh, so you're not going to be able to learn that unless you get some hands-on experience. That's why I offer the service I do where I can keep bees for the people because some people just don't want to go through that. And I completely understand. If you lose bees, if you have to buy bees every every year because you keep losing them over the winter, the mites and starvation, yeah, it's not going to be great. Um, I definitely save up some money if you are going to do this because it is not a cheap hobby. Uh, <laughs> even your first year, if you just buy one hive, you're probably already in the red about a thousand maybe twelve hundred dollars which may not be a lot to you, a lot of you uh but if you're really trying to grow your operations it can become expensive um and yeah you can and, and you can again you can uh take care of if you can, if you have a beekeeper that you know in your area maybe you like go to his house or their house and say hey let me see what this is all about i'll take a look at your hive every once in a while and just get your hands dirty sticky Nessie, whatever you want to call it, stung. Um, 
and just learn if that's something for you. Yes. Good. It's specifically me, yes. Uh, it's, it's a monthly subscription. I do pretty much everywhere now I do it. It's uh, 140 a month and initial fee of uh, $400 for the hive. Um, but again, at the end of the year, you get all the honey. Sometimes you can get, even get 50 pounds of honey, maybe more than that. And that's 10 pounds of honey. That's $600. You can sell that. You do whatever you want with it. But again, I really want to cater to people that just want the experience of cutting bees. You can find more of that on my website if you want any more information or talk to me after the class. Uh, but I'm really, really, really excited about this too here. Uh, oh, sorry, I didn't repeat the question. Ah, I'm going to catch <laughs> they heard it. They heard it. Not... They figured it out. <laughs> Data bees are also suffering. Climate change is forcing them out of the land or, or their habitat and land loss, especially in a place like Charlotte that's constantly being developed. Uh, they're losing their native habitats. We've got sweat bees. We've got mason bees. We've got bumblebees. Even the hated yellow jackets and hornets. I know, I know, but they're native. They're supposed to be here, but yet we don't treat them the same. We don't think of them the same or as important, but they are so important. Sometimes there's a flower in the wild that is only pollinated by a certain bee. I know bumblebees because they're the way they vibrate and whatnot, their vibrations can only open certain flowers. So we need to be caring about not just honeybees here. I love honeybees again, 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 but if you can do anything, which I'll talk more about in your next slide, is to be more focused on all these pollinators because they play such an important role in our ecosystems. How can you do that? Next slide. Plant native flowers, number one. Get rid of your grass. There's an excellent little brochure there that I saw that was like, that's perfect for what I'm about to present today. Get rid of your grass, plant native flowers, screw what your neighbor's saying. It looks great. Yeah. <laughs> I know you, you don't have to cut it as much. Really, you can just let it go. And I mean, obviously you maybe not put it in your front yard, but maybe you have a section in your backyard where you just put some native flowers and just let it go to town. You let all sorts of uh, native pollinators, native insects dwell in there. Um, and just, we, we have to have those areas, even if it's just like a, a, a square foot or a couple square feet, allowing that to, to, to happen and, and just grow in your yard is going to do so much good for our ecosystems. Support local beekeepers, buy honey, um, put out water troughs in the spring and summer for bees and other pollinators. If you want bees and you want to know how to get them, just set up a swarm trap in your yard. If you have, especially if you have neighbors who have bees, guess what? You're going to have a swarm in your swarm trap. There you go. You have bees in your yard. You, you may not even have to actually take care of them. They might just exist on their own. And, and if you do find this interesting, please share this with other people. There is, I am so impressed with communities like this, with the beekeeping community, with the native plant society, that there are people that care about the stuff. But we are still such a small population. We need to grow this stuff. We need to inform people however we can. Maybe that's beekeeping. Maybe that's telling them about birds. Maybe that's telling about all the interesting flowers that you have in your yard. But we need to, we are in such a desperate need of this information and to share this information. I can't emphasize it enough. Um, so whatever you're passionate about when it comes to ecology and insects and birds and whatever, like make that your thing and share it as best you can because they need us so bad and they don't have a voice. They won't have a voice until we make it our own. Yes. Justin, are there any negative comments that you'd like to make about mosquito killing services? <laughs> How much time do we have? So, repeat. There's, so I, I won't say, of course I hate it, but, oh, repeat, repeat. Is there any, <laughs> is there any negative things I'd like to say about mosquito repelling things? Yes. However, I'll hold my tongue and just sit and talk on the things that you can do to repel mosquitoes that don't involve broad spectrum pesticides, or really any sort of pest control that involves broad spectrum pesticides. Get away from it. 
It's I know it, it, it it's 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 easy, it's quick, but what are you doing in the process? What if that stuff washes away, goes in a stream? How many invertebrates are you killing by using that stuff? It's not great. Um, if you have mosquitoes, here's what you do. Take a bucket. <laughs> bucket of doom. Bucket of doom. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. I didn't have that tagline, but you put water in it. You know where the mosquitoes are going. They all collect in that bucket. And then you take those mosquito dumps, which are actually, they only affect the mosquito larva. Believe me, because I have pools of water in my backyard, kiddie pools full of water that the, uh, the bees drink out of. And I load those things up with mosquito dumps. They have no negative consequences on the bees whatsoever, or for that matter, any other insects in my yard. Because it, believe me, it's still thriving and humming. Even the ticks love my water in my yard. <laughs> believe me. Um, unfortunately, but so just, just getting away from broad spectrum pesticides is number one. And, and, and there's a lot of different resources you can find on that online or wherever, but do, do your due diligence with that. And that's really all I got. What is a swarm trap? What is a swarm trap? Um, it's, it can be anything. It can be anything and everything. Essentially a cavity you may want to hang it about 10 feet up in a tree or up on your house or wherever um, that you would imagine the uh, bees might migrate to. Now, ideally, they want that idyllic hole in the tree, Winnie the Pooh-esque thing. So maybe you take one of those boxes that has uh, some amount of space in it. You maybe take a couple frames of used bee comb, honey bee comb, that smells like bees, essentially when they're swarming, they want to go places that they know honeybees have existed and thrived before. So they're looking for smells. They basically, they line everything off smells. They don't see very well. Smell is very key to them. And then you take a bait or lure that smells a lot like lemongrass oil, because that mimics this, uh, the smell of the queen. And you put it, just a little bit of it, into the box. And before you, before you know it, you got bees in your box. Hmm. Yep. Yes. Perfect segue to my uh, beekeeper etiquette question. We have an owl box, a barn <laughs> owl box, oh, in the yard, which is about 30 feet up in the tree. About two or three years ago, after the owls had used the box, it attracted a swarm of bees, which were extricated quite skillfully <laughs> by two Mecklenburg beekeeper members. Should they have gifted us with some honey? <laughs> <laughs> Mm. That's a good. Well, if it was, if if you have a swarm in your yard, if someone collects the bees, just in general, should those beekeepers give you the honey, give you honey at all? That's like a jar of honey. That would. That's definitely fine. Yeah, yeah. A jar of honey. Just don't expect all the honey those bees produce. Be. No, I'm not getting high the bees from your yard. What about killer bees? Okay, uh, so yes, killer bees, otherwise known as Africanized bees. So, like that's in Africa. What do they got to do with us? Uh, actually, a lot. So they're starting to uh, the American Southwest, and as uh, climate warms, as it is, they're spreading the reach. They've even started in Florida, and they have potential to reach. North Carolina, we found some hives that have very, very bad temperament that you would probably identify as, if not uh, Africanized bees, as having been mated with a bee that has Africanized genetics. And so it, it does pose a problem, not so much here, but again, in the American Southwest, Texas, Arizona, um, Nevada, they are really struggling with that at this point. Um, and they are not fun, uh, as you can imagine. There's videos of people having to extract these hives, and they are just coated with not only the bees, but the stingers of the bees. They wear the extra heavy, super duty suits. And as and, and you can imagine, out in the desert, not ideal in the first place. But even still, these bees will just not let up. Uh, they will, if you run away, go into the water, they will be hovering over the water that they saw you dive under. So they are very persistent. And uh, apparently they make a lot of honey. I don't really want to find that out, you know, but it's, it's, it's something, I think it's because 
the beekeepers mess with the bees so infrequently that they're able to just do whatever and they make a lot of honey. But yeah, um, don't mess with Africanized bees, I would say. Do, do they phenotypically look any different or is it just behavior and genotypically? Uh, are they phenotypically any different than the, as far as appearance than European? They are a little bit smaller, um, but it's mainly just temperament, yeah. We, today on our bird walk out at Chantilly, mm -hmm. uh, there is a hive in a tree. Is it? It's, it's an exposed, I mean, you can see. Yeah. Well, no, it's not, it's actually out on the tree. Um, you see the, the layers like, like you have for the. Yeah. Um, but it's exposed. It's not in anything. And it's moved from one tree to another. It used to be in one tree over here. And now it's over in the other one. Does it, I mean, does it have any exterior to it? Like a, it's not like a it's paper not, wasp? No, no, it's not a paper wasp. You can actually, just like you, you see the way you call the frames in mm -hmm. your thing, you can see frames. That's okay. really cool. So that's, that is. It's a good, it must be about this day. It's, it's good size. And that they've actually, so at that point, when you see those layers, mm -hmm. that's them building the wax that's their home right they have a certain space in between that wax that allows air to flow through mm -hmm. ideally of course they want some cavity something that would provide shelter but if there's a will there's a way if they're doing well enough there and they've got the foods to do that um yeah they're gonna survive yeah, there. It's, a, it's big that's yeah. cool um yeah it, i may not be able to reach it but call the swarm does we probably at this point if it's anywhere near residential area then you probably want to catch that and, and make sure it doesn't get out well it, it's in the chantilly uh nature preserve oh, oh yeah that, that's yeah let it it's go the, uh, even chantilly neighborhood I was like, no 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 well i mean it's adjacent to the sure, sure. neighborhood but it's out in it's in the uh, preserve okay area that's fine that's uh, great it's in, it's in an oak tree i mean yeah. it's just a big oak that it sits in there let it go yeah that's cool so did they move it from one place because it was in one tree last year and it's moved over. It's in a different tree this year. The bees moved. Yeah. Yeah. They swarmed, mm -hmm. or they just got tired of the old spot and left. Who knows? Um, but yeah, that's really cool. You don't see that a lot. Now, normally we see hives, and it's people maintaining the hives, not the other way, or not in the wild. Yes. In the winter, when you were saying the hive, so they'll do they hibernate? I mean, do they stay in there, or do they kind of come and go? Or they're basically just stay in the hive. So they, the we question do. is, I'm getting it now. Um, the question is, what are the bees, essentially, what do the bees do in the winter? Do they hibernate? Answer, no, not really. They're still very active, except they're just very, very cold. And they normally don't leave the hive unless it's about uh, any, anywhere over 50 degrees. Um, so if it's cold, they're going to stay bundled up in that hive. They're going to be moving around as in vibrating their, free, uh, their wings to keep the hive warm. They want to keep that cluster, what we call a cluster of bees, at a certain temperature so that the brood, the baby bees, do not die. So they're really, really active. They're just moving very, very small. Yeah. So the babies are in the winter doing nothing and then they emerge. Mm -hmm. the yep. And there's actually, so there's summer bees, which we talked about live about six to seven weeks. Winter bees have adaptations that allow them to live up to six months. So when they're laid, their, their eggs are laid in late fall, early fall, um, those eggs will then develop into pretty much super bees that have all these advantages that allow them to survive through the winter. So yeah, great question. Yes. We thought for the number of hives that are like good for you to keep everything going, but don't take over your life. If there is, uh, is there a sweet spot for bees for a number of hives that won't take over your life, but also give you all the things you want from them? I'd say anywhere from half a dozen to a dozen, honestly. Um, depends on what you mean what what standard of life you still want to have because <laughs> I, I i started this as a hobby and even still it was occupying a lot of my time but that's basically because i didn't know what i was doing and it took me maybe even 45 minutes to an hour to inspect a hive now if you get 
you're, you know, you get everything in line and you start to know what you're doing. It may take you five minutes to inspect the hive and there. You can look at six hives, no problem. So it just kind of like everything else beekeeping, it just kind of depends on what you want, what your time is. But like, honestly, four or five hives, you're not gonna, you're not gonna spend that much time with four or five hives. You know, it's, it should be pretty manageable. And you still get, I mean, we're talking 30, 50 pounds of honey per hive. So there you go. You've already got like 200, maybe pounds of honey. Yeah, that's a lot of honey. You can you can do a lot of things with that. Yeah. Any other questions? One more question. Share it. Yes. Repeat that. Yes. Uh, she mentioned that. It, if you want to join MECB's uh, school, it starts, the registration opens for, what was it, what was the date? November 1st. November 1st of this year. And it goes on to the winter. Okay. Well, thanks for having me, y'all. One more announcement that I forgot at the beginning. Thanks, Steve. I just wanted to mention um, that the Charlotte Nature, um, sorry, <laughs> um, Earth Day, I was still in B mode. Yeah. Charlotte Earth Day is coming up a week from Saturday, day after tomorrow. So that's April the 15th, kind of an easy number to remember. And the National Earth Day is a week after that, but ours is gonna be held in the first ward park it's a small park right across from Maginon, the Children's Library on 7th Street. And it is from 10 in the morning till three in the afternoon. It's got all kinds of activities and tables of information, uh, north, south, east, and west, soil, air, water, and energy. And then there is a table on leadership for children that are inclined. So there's a lot going on, it's a lot of fun. We have 10 foot tall puppets, which uh, are quite impressive. And I invite you all to come, it's absolutely free. It's, uh, of course, they're foundations that are supporting it. This is the second one, and um, it's just for your information. It's designed for children from five to 15 and their parents and their friends. Great. Thanks, Thank thanks you. so much. I think we're going to join adjourn the meeting. Thanks again to Justin. And Hello. next month we have Strummer Edwards, who'll talk about his time in the Peruvian cloud forest banding birds. Hope to see you next time. Yeah.